Great. So, Dean here from Mad Mimi Email Newsletters or Email Marketing. We kind of uh, switch between the two. I am recording this, so we will be able to have a reference at some point. I will upload it to YouTube or um, the Amoeba folks who very wonderfully worked with us to set this up. Uh, one of us will upload it somewhere, we'll let everyone know and you'll be able to reference everything. I'll also put the slides up on SlideShare after the, after the webinar. So a couple other things. I may move fairly quickly. I have a lot of content to share with everyone. But if you guys want me to um, focus on anything, if you have any questions to ask, feel free to speak up. Use that chat. It's the little speech bubble. Um, you should see it probably at the top of your screen. Just feel free to interrupt with some questions. I may only see it later, but if I see it in the flow, I'm happy to tackle it. So feel free. And with that, let's jump into Simple Marketing Tactics to Grow and Thrive, presented by yours truly, Dean. So a little bit about Mad Mimi, if anyone doesn't know what Mad Mimi is. Mad Mimi is an email marketing platform that makes sending emails super simple. Our key offering is a very simple newsletter composer that is not complex and is super easy. Actually uh, Mashable, when they tested it way back when, their start time to send from, from sign up to send was seven minutes. Just to give you an idea, we send out about 40 million newsletters a day and um, we have about 70 integrations with various other companies like Salesforce, Hi-Rise, some CRM, some web builders, lots of good stuff. And we offer ourselves great sign-up forms, autoresponders, analytics, RSS to email, um, a whole bunch of cool things. Great. We'll be talking about three main segments, getting subscribers, competing locally and engaging customers through email. Getting subscribers, well, every time I do a talk, people say to me, Dean, how do I grow my list of subscribers for newsletters to market to, to all the good things that newsletters do? We'll be discussing growing your email list. Competing locally, this really is about SEO. How does an independent business compete with the big box stores with those um, big companies that have huge marketing budgets. There is a way to do it and we'll touch on that in the middle. And then email, that's really what I'm an expert in. So we'll definitely be chatting about email. So let's dive in. Part one, getting subscribers. The first thing to do is create an effective sign up form. And the key thing, so just let's, let's jump in here and be clear. A sign up form is a little widget, if you will, a space on your website that your visitors to your site can sign up to receive your newsletter. And this is a great way to, to capture interested people, existing customers, potential customers, and then you can reach out via email to, to chat to them down the line. I touch on that in the third section, but let's focus on a sign up form because putting a sign up form on your website, to my mind, is the bare minimum that any business should do in order to make sure that you're constantly growing in a very simple, easy, and fairly effortless way. The first thing you need to do is keep your sign up form simple. Don't ask for info that you don't need. And that means keeping it to just email address. If you need a name to say, Dear Dean, Dear John, uh, Dear Angela, then fine, ask for name. But if you don't need to ask for if you don't need to use a zip code for your, your marketing efforts, don't ask for a zip code. Don't ask for state or anything like that unless it's vital. The more stuff that you ask for, the bigger the barrier to sign up. Also, um, things like captures, it, so, it seems like a good idea but they're a hassle and people will, would rather move on with their day than try and decipher that stuff. So instead of using captures, what you can do is use double opt-in versus single opt-in. And what that means is double opt-in requires an extra step before someone finishes their subscription 
single opt-in when they enter their email address and they hit subscribe, they're in. Double opt-in triggers an email to them that says confirm your subscription. Double opt-in is, a, is a, a very nice tool to make sure that you only have highly engaged customers. So if you are going to be sending just really deep discounts via email, I recommend double opt-in so you can make sure that you're sending these discounts to people that are highly engaged. But if you're just looking to grow, single opt-in is fine. There's really, there's no reason to, av to avoid single opt-in. It's simple, it's okay. If you do see a large amount of junky email addresses, if you suddenly go from five signups a day to 500 in the last hour, then you've got an issue and your, your ESP should, um, and, and Mad Mimi is an ESP, MailChimp, Constant Contact, we're all ESPs then your ESP should jump in and help sort that out. But if you, um, if you see a reasonable amount of signups, single opt-in is totally fine. So I am gonna jump into chat. Jeff asks an awesome question. Do I have a percentage of the decrease? No, I think, I, and I'm, I'm, too, I'm honest, honestly doubtful, Jeff, that anyone would have an accurate um, specific decrease. I do know that it's significant. If you ask for city and state, if, it's a, if it feels appropriate to what you're actually doing, say you're a touring musician and city and state is going to bring the band to your state, then I'm pretty sure it's not going to have a, a huge decrease in signups. But I, I know most of you guys listening in here are probably not touring bands. So I think, again, it comes down, if it feels appropriate for the subscriber, it's probably not going to be a big deal. But as long as you're aware of the more information you ask, the more of a chore it appears to your potential subscribers. So simple it should be your default. One thing that you might want to consider if you are um, concerned about this is trying both. If you have a steady um, sign up rate, ask for city and state and see if that decreases for your particular audience. And one thing that I, I do want to mention is that I'm very wary of, of giving um, statistics out unless I'm positive about them. And what I mean by that is that it's like saying the statistics between mobile versus desktop. The average for people who read a newsletter uh, on their phone is around 60%. But does that mean you will have a 60% mobile readership? Absolutely not. If, if you uh, have a younger audience, you might have a 90% mobile viewer. If you have an audience that reads at work, you might have a 90% desktop viewer. So I think the key thing is to look at your own audience who you know far better than I do. So, um, but the rule of thumb for sign-up forms that are effective is simple. And... Final, final point here, single opt-in tends to have a higher sign-up rate but leaves you at risk of lower engagement. I touched on that. Double opt-in is your most engaged way. It requires an extra step. But again, that's up to you whether you want people to take that extra step. So let's look at effective placement. Effective placement, your sign-up form should be up top, somewhere obvious. I keep seeing a lot of people add the subscribe form down below, and I don't think that's a great idea. Above the fold is the place to go, and if you're not sure what above the fold means, it's simply anywhere on your website that people can show up to and see without needing to scroll anywhere. If scrolling is needed, it's below the fold. So don't hide your sign up in the footer, put it somewhere obvious. And if you do have a sidebar, that's okay, but again, keep the sign up forms position above the fold. Other options you have if you just can't do that is stuff like Many Contacts. Many Contacts is a pretty cool um, app that does this that you'll see here uh, in that picture below. It's, it's a, um, essentially a banner that shows up and you can, uh, you can ask for a subscription at that moment. Great, so here is a really good example of effective sign-up forms here. On the left-hand side, you'll see quite clearly Seth Godin has a subscribe form. Something else that you'll notice that he has 
is incentives. He says, don't miss a thing, free updates by email. He also says, click on my head. And when you click on his head, it's actually another subscription form. Uh, make sure that it's obvious. You'll see here, the only thing that's orange and bright is the background behind his head, which is a sign up form, and the subscribe button where he incentivizes subscribing. Now on his actual um, other homepage here, you'll see subscribe for free. Again, it's a little bit incentivized. Oops, I, I jumped all the way up to the top. Let me zoom back there. Um, you'll see subscribe for free. He's made it always very obvious that he wants you to subscribe to his newsletter. Here's another one. Sign up for brianeisenberg.com email updates. Big, big obvious sign up form there. Um, there are other cool things that you can do with sign up forms. You can add them in your Twitter and Facebook profiles, and I'll show you where you can do that shortly. You can post links to your subscribe landing pages in your actual stream. You can use the About Me profile, which I'll show you as well. And every page on your blog should have a, an option to sign up. If you guys have a blog, after each post on the sidebar up top somewhere, you should never make someone search for the ability to sign up. And one thing I do want to stress is I'm a big fan of incentivizing signups, but it doesn't have to be a, a monetary incentive. You don't have to devalue your, your product or your work by saying half off or free this or free that. But my incent by incentivizing subscription, what I mean is tell them the value that they're going to get. Sign up for my newsletter you'll get the latest news, you'll get my expert advice, you'll get um, access to the latest products. If there's a, a way to incentivize it tastefully that suits your own goals, go for it. So with that, let's look at what I mean by adding it to your profile. So you'll see here, Mad Mimi has a sign-up form for our weekly hangouts in our Twitter profile. So anytime someone visits our Twitter page, they have the option to sign up. Similarly, I post the, that same URL to our sign up form very often. Um, and I guess here's a good, a good moment to stop and say Madmini offers a hosted sign up form, and I'm pretty sure all of our um, competitors do as well. I'm not here to oversell you guys on Madmini, I just want to be clear that. These are standard things that you should be able to, to find with any email service provider you guys use. Same thing on Facebook. We have email sign-up options as well as simply saying, hey guys, why not subscribe? Why not sign up in the Facebook feeds? It's, a, it's okay to be proactive and it's okay to actively ask people, hey, why don't you subscribe, why don't you join in, um, why don't you get engaged. One other thing I wanted to share before we move on to the second section is some other cool tools to grow your subscribers and your customer base. So it was too much to include here, but if you go to this URL, you'll be able to see a whole list, I think it's about three slides worth of other companies that are pretty awesome at growing your, your email list. So I'll give everyone a minute if you want to write this down, but if you go to madmimi email on slideshare.net, you will be able to find this and download it and then everything gets clickable. All the links in that slide are, are clickable there. So um, I'll move on, but again, all of the stuff will be available as well afterwards. Cool, part two, competing locally. And this, this to me is super fun. If you search for a product, let's say ice cream, you might find Ben and Jerry's, you might find um, Hagen Dust and all of them. But if you're a local ice cream seller who hand crafts your amazing unique ice cream, you're struggling against these big guys who have all the marketing, all the SEO, but there is a way to compete, and that's locally. 
especially if you're a brick and mortar store, local is the only thing that really matters to you. So there are some options that you have and let's touch it. So first of all, does anyone not know what SEO is? Um, you, can, you can speak up here, but I'll give you a very quick rundown on what SEO means. SEO is search engine optimization. Search engine optimization has to do with when someone Googles you, they can find you. Google, Yahoo, etc. When someone, what, what they provide their customers, that's anyone who searches, they provide the customers a service that says when you look for something, we'll try and find the most relevant results. And that's, that word relevant is really what becomes important. So Google trawls the web with their bots or their spiders and they index everything. And, and what they do is they look for keywords and they, they try and make sure that they're providing relevant content to the people who search. And so when someone searches, the search engine calculates the relevance of the results and presents it to the Googler or the searcher. So the more popular the site, the more Google thinks, wow, this must be super relevant, the more importance the search engine gives it, and then voila, it shows up higher in the rankings. The higher the importance, the higher the ranking, the more likely it is for people to see it. And it is worth noting that most people click on the very first link that shows up. The rest click at something like 80% click on the very first couple of, um, of results. Most people never get beyond the first page. So SEO is super important. Um, Moz, over there, moz.com is a great place to, to educate yourself about how search engines work. And there's a link uh, that will be available in the slides afterwards on how search engines work. So optimizing your site for SEO is really important. And I'm going to zoom through this a bit because I actually want to get to schema. And schema is the fun bit, but let's just run through. Optimizing your site means making sure that Google can understand what, you're, what you do, what's important. So they're not looking for the thes and the ands and the buts and the ifs. They're looking for things like email marketing because that's what, that's what we do. So when I think of SEO, I think of the words email newsletter, email marketing. What I do is I make sure that those words are in headings. So Google knows they're, they're important because I'm telling Google they're important. So it starts with HTML. And if you're not familiar with the basics of HTML, please do ask someone to review your site and just make sure that it's marked up correctly. I'm not going to get, it's, it's not terribly difficult. It sound, if you know nothing about HTML, it sounds a little bit intense, but it's really quite commonsensical. Uh, it all makes sense to someone with a rudimentary knowledge about HTML, and it's worth just asking someone. Don't spend hundreds of dollars on this. Um, find someone who knows some HTML and make them dinner. That's all. This really is not a big deal um, to, to implement, but it is important to actually keep in mind. Then in your actual content, and if you use something like WordPress, most of the stuff's already done in the background for you. If you label something as a heading, it's going to be an H1 tag or an H2 tag. So don't, don't stress this stuff. But what you do need to stress is use keywords. So if you have a section, make sure that the phrase or the word is important to someone who's searching for you. So again, let's use ice cream as an example. And you'll see why I'm using ice cream as an example fairly soon. But ice cream matters. You, you don't say things like, cold for ice cream, you'll say things like ice cream for ice cream. So make sure that your headings, your, your major stuff up top has the keywords that matter. So if you are a local ice cream place, have your town name, say ice cream in Honolulu, if that's where you're at. So just keep the stuff vaguely in mind when you craft your website and you'll start to do fine. You'll have your good baseline and also links into your site and outside your site to similar content is super helpful. And finally, your links should indeed be descriptive. So if you're, instead of saying the words like click here, say, get the best ice cream in New Hampshire. 
and make that whole phrase clickable. So Google knows the words ice cream in New Hampshire are what's relevant. So moving on to the, the tricky bit. Now this is where it gets a little bit technical, so bear with me and know this. You guys don't need to walk away from this understanding everything about schema. Just know that it exists and when you have an opportunity, dive into it. It is fairly easy to understand, but it does, it, it does look much more complex than it is. Schema is kind of like HTML. It's, it's the next level of HTML, not in complexity, but in granularity. And what I mean by that is if you are a consultant, if you are a local business, Schema gives you the opportunity to tell Google exactly what you do. It lets you really tell Google what you're relevant for. And it helps search engines understand your content better, which is cool because if you use Schema in, on your site, Google pays a little bit more attention to you and says, oh, this, this person's helping me out. And if this is done, Google will be very happy. So I'm going to read this. This, this third point is straight from Schema. Schema.org provides a collection of shared vocabularies webmasters can use to mark up their pages in ways that can be understood by search engines. That's, that's really what it is. It's a way for you to tell the search engine, hey, here's what I do. When people search for things that are relevant, you know I'm relevant. Um, so Schema is special because Schema allows you to tell Google you're a local business. Now here's where it gets super cool, right? Is if I'm in New Hampshire and I want ice cream and I'll type in ice cream stores in New Hampshire. You have used Schema to tell Google that you are a New Hampshire ice cream store. And even if the searcher doesn't say that they're in New Hampshire, if they just search ice cream, Google knows that they're in New Hampshire because it's Google. So Google will present the searcher with the most relevant content. And you have told Google that you are a local ice cream store, local to that person searching for ice cream. Therefore, you are relevant. And this is a way that you can appear more relevant than Ben and Jerry's to that person searching for ice cream. So that, that's a really powerful way to use schema. So let me just jump back into the slide. I'm not going to get too deep into the technical aspects of, of schema because it does require a webmaster or someone with a little bit of HTML knowledge. But please know that it's out there. And when you have time, take a look and see if that will work for you. You can do it for people, all types of businesses, um, services you offer. It's really, really important. So with this idea about local and staying local and showing that you're local, we're going to jump into review sites. A lot of businesses hate review sites because of negative reviews. But what you can do, um, sorry, uh, some folks are, are having trouble seeing images. I don't know what you can do. I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with, with views, but John, um, I will certainly provide the slide um, at the end and you'll be able to see everything. Uh, and you'll be able to as well email me anytime. We can even chat on the phone sometime this week and I will uh, I'll fill in any gaps. Great, so review sites are very helpful for SEO and for competing with the box stores simply because they are SEO optimized. Yelp, TripAdvisor, and there's tons and tons of review sites which I link to over here. You can't click on it right now, I think. But again, when I provide the slides to everyone who's here, you'll be able to click and get a list of, of uh, review sites. Uh, review sites have done all this SEO work already. So when I search ice cream in Honolulu, Yelp, TripAdvisor, they, they they're going to comp they're going to fight to be up top there and be that first result which gets all those clicks. So I do recommend getting friends, getting family, getting your customers to leave positive reviews. 
don't try and game it by saying, hey, I'll give you $10 if you leave a positive review. They're fairly sensitive to that and they can, they can kind of smell when you're trying to game them in most cases. But if you simply ask all of your happy customers to do, to, to leave a review, people will leave a positive review. And there's a couple of things you can do to actually generate reviews and that's use your email marketing skills. And every time you provide a service, follow up a day later, a week later with an email that says, hey, if you're happy, click here to leave a review and link directly to the review site where you'd like that positive, positive review. So if you use a, a customer relationship manager tool like HiRise or Salesforce, build that in there. You can use Mad Mimi's autoresponders to, to automate this process. But I know for there's a running tour in Atlanta who's one of the top um, results when you look for things to do in Atlanta because simply she asks everyone she knows who runs with her on this running tour to leave a review. And I took a hike in South Africa where I'm from with an amazing hiking guide simply because I found her on TripAdvisor because she asks everyone she knows to leave a positive review on TripAdvisor. And I did that as well. I left a review. So don't be afraid to ask for this stuff. Don't be passive. And if you're, if you're proactive about encouraging reviews, you will get positive reviews because you'll be asking people who have worked with you and left happy. So um, the last aspect is a product. Now, I'm going to jump to the bottom here. There's a disclosure. Mad Mimi was recently acquired by GoDaddy. Get Found Online is a GoDaddy product. It's also called Loku, L-O-C-U. Loku, Get Found Online, they're the same thing. It's a really cool product that actually updates Yelp and menu pages and all these, these listing sites automatically. Um, it'll update Yelp, TripAdvisor, Facebook, OpenTable, uh, and it, it handles this stuff and it boosts your SEO value. So I'm not going to try and sell you on a product that is owned by a parent that the reason I'm including this is because it's powerful and I'm going to actually switch content here. I'm going to show you what good SEO results look like once this loads the image. So I hope you can all see this, but this is what awesome SEO looks like. And you'll see here, first of all, on the right where it says Herald's ice cream, it's got the address, all of that stuff. That comes from schema. That's why schema matters. Um, all of this, this really good information, you'll see when you're searching in Northampton, Massachusetts for ice cream, this local business is going to shop far above all the other big names. They're not, they're not going to shop as buy ice cream at Walmart or buy ice cream at, um, I don't know, your local supermarket because they have taken getting found locally seriously. And this search was done in Massachusetts. So you're going to be able to, with SEO, target the people that you need to target. So with that, let's move back to to my slides. So um, that's that's really it for, for SEO. I've only scratched the surface of SEO, but if you pay attention to these areas, the review sites, making sure that Google knows that you're a local business, you're going to be able to compete with the big guys um, because you're actually going to be more relevant. And Google wants to show you to the searcher. Google doesn't want to show Walmart to the, the people searching. They want to show you because you're the right person for these searches to see. So please keep that in mind and dive into SEO a little bit more. Great. So now we get into my real realm here. Um, actually, you know what? I just had a thought. I'm going to tell you a little SEO story. Before Mad Mimi paid attention to SEO, we would get tens of people randomly stumbling across Mad Mimi a month. Now we get hundreds a day. And that's simply because we pay attention to SEO. We churn out good content that's keyword rich. 
on our blog, we 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 worked towards getting an SEO, and it took time, and it's a long it's it's a long game. It's not something that happens overnight. But after paying attention to this stuff mildly for a few months, we started to see results, and it really pays off. So I can't encourage you guys to dive into SEO enough. Great. So email. Email newsletters are very important. And that's not just because Mad Meanie does email newsletters. Emails are important because people want to receive emails. Uh, I'm gonna jump around on this slide a little bit. If you look at the last point, eight in 10 people say the marketing emails they receive go mainly into their primary personal email account and displayed alongside their personal emails. Also, most people want emails from businesses they like. They don't, that, that sounds a little bit ridiculous because we all think, oh, we get too many emails, but the key element there is businesses people like. People don't want emails from businesses we don't like. Those are the ones we unsubscribe or, or mark spam. But if you took to heart my advice from the very first segment and get engaged subscribers that are opt-in rather than purchasing lists, for example, you're going to get people who want to hear from you and engage from you. And the key element here is that it's low cost. So, for example, and again, I don't mean to sell Mad Mimi to you guys uh, in, in a heavy-handed manner, but Mad Mimi has a free account. And actually, if you're Amoeba members, you, you get an amazing uh, free offer from Mad Mimi. But most... Well, Mad Mimi offers free for, for anyone for up to 2,500 contacts. Um, some other competitors also offer really awesome free accounts. And if you don't have 100,000 contacts, the price is fairly low anyways. We're talking 10, 20, 30 dollars a month. So for every one dollar spent, the average return on investment is 44 dollars. That's, that's enormous. Facebook tends to be one to one. One dollar spent gets you another one dollar ROI. To put that into perspective, forty-four dollars to one dollars email is impactful, and forty-four percent of email recipients made at least one purchase last year based on a promotional email. So, how do you do email marketing? Well, like with the subscribe form I mentioned in the first section, keep things simple. A simple short newsletter that takes you less than an hour to craft is the way to go. I don't believe newsletters should be long. I don't believe newsletters should be complex. I think newsletters should never be a chore. It should be something simple and easy to do. But the first thing you have to do is you need to set a goal. What do you want this newsletter to actually accomplish for you? And the goal needs to be specific. It needs to be a measurable, achievable goal. I'm going to say that again, measurable, achievable goal. So the goal can't be, I want to be rich. That's a great goal to have, but you need to break things down a little bit more than that. The goal can't even be, I want to sell more of my products. The goal should be something like, I want to get 5% more traffic to my blog. I want to sell five more hammers. Uh, I want to sell three more red shirts. I want to get one email recipient to engage my services. Specific goal. And the reason you need specific and small is because you're more likely to reach that goal. And if you're not reaching that goal, you're more likely to be able to make a small change that allows you to reach that goal. So by having a measurable goal with a very clear point of success and failure, and surpassing the success to huge success, that's important. Without the measurable finite line that you can either fall short, reach, or surpass, you can't really improve. So I, I think without having a goal, you can't craft a proper newsletter or a proper email. So once you have your goal, let's use the goal of, I want to sell 10 more red shirts. So you can craft your content by having a picture of a red shirt, a little three-line description of the red shirt, and a big link that says, click here to buy the red shirt. Newsletter done, 
send that to your customers, I guarantee you will sell more red shirts. If you say, hey, we have a lot of new products, some news, all sorts of interesting things, you're never going to get around to selling your red shirts. Your customers don't know what it is you want them to even do. And email marketing is not going to be used to its fullest advantage. So let me get back to my slide. You always have a call to action, and that's important. You need to tell your customers what to do next. So they've received the email. Now what? Open the email. Okay, now what? Click here to buy the red shirts. You need to have that call to action. So you've set your goal, you've crafted the content to fit that goal, and you've set your call to action. You're going to have a successful newsletter, and it's only going to take you 20 minutes to actually create, design, and hit send. Do that once a month, you'll sell more. You'll get hired more. Whatever it is your goal is, if you keep it simple, you will achieve it. So with that in mind, link placement should always be high above the fold. Same as that subscribe, uh, subscribe form on your website. People read a newsletter for less than five seconds before moving on unless something drastically grabs their attention. So the link, the call to action should be up high. Use images to compel more clicks. People like clicking on images, fairly simple. And seriously, set that goal. Just taking a sip of water there, if, if anyone heard some, some gurgling. Um, great. So here's a couple cool examples. This one by TaskRabbit. I mean, you can look at this. This clearly took minutes to do, just minutes. But in two seconds or less, you know they want you to post a task. So if you're a TaskRabbit recipient, you, you know a little bit more about task grabbing, you know they're about posting tasks, so that's it. This button is clickable. It's an amazing email, it's short, it's simple, anyone can do it in minutes, this isn't a chore. Here's another example. These guys are one of our consistently highest performing senders, and it's also short. This Where this cuts off is at the end of the email. There's, there's nothing more below that, but you can see here, they got thousands of clicks on this picture that says buy my book and also a huge amount of um, clicks here, 35 percent on this all new patterns in it. It's the it's the same link. It's up top. It's obvious. It's amazing. Um, the results are huge. It helps that they're knitters. If anyone knows knitters, they're fairly passionate about knitting. So they have a very engaged audience and it's rare to receive these results, but to get 57% click through rate is utterly incredible. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just a really impactful, impactful image. And you'll see here, it says view the new lookbook. Now people clicked on that. It tells you what to do. Um, so, how do you get people to actually open your newsletter to get to that point? Subject line. The subject line drives the view rates. 64% of people open an email because of the subject line. And also, here's a couple just quick points about subject lines that I've noticed in analyzing many, many subject lines. Uh, Click-through rate is higher when there's a name in the subject line. The recipient's name, Dear Dean, or you know, saying Dear Dean maybe is not ideal, but saying, here's some content for you, Dean. That's a terrible subject line. Let me think of something else. Um, special news for you, Dean. There you go. That's going to drive a little bit more, um, but it has to be special to me. Don't, don't fake anyone out here. Be clear, what is in the newsletter? The subject line should, should describe what the content is. So be clear, don't go overboard trying to be funny, definitely focus on describing what is in the actual newsletter and keep it short. Six words is kind of like the sweet spot, but anything under 10 words is cool. And the reason that's cool is because people can grasp 
grasp the content right away. Short subject lines always have a higher, not always, most of the time have a high, a higher click-through rate. Also, people zooming by on their phone or in their inbox can actually grasp the gist right there in the preview without even needing to click through and they can be compelled because it's, it's interesting and click through. Keeping it short is important. Don't do it unnaturally. If you need 12 words or 13 words, go for it. But again, keep in mind, some of them might be cut off, so have your real content in the first part of the subject line. And good content, setting your goal will drive your subject line. If you're not sure what your subject line is, ask yourself what the goal is. Hey Dean, check out our latest awesome red shirts. There you go. And include your name as well. This is something I noticed in analyzing tens of thousands of subject lines is when there is your name, company name, not necessarily your name as in my name is Dean, but your name as in the company name or the product name in the subject line seems to have a higher click-through rate. I might be mistaking um, causation for correlation if that's the, the term that I want but it just it seems to work and I believe personally it has to do with the the interest that it generates it just seems to work so here are some great subject lines only three days left for this great offer for company name readers so this one achieves a few interesting things it creates a sense of urgency only three days left it highlights the value inherent in the subject line. It includes the company name. And because it says company name, let's, let's substitute Mad Mimi for the company name. Only three days left for this great offer for Mad Mimi readers. So that also adds in an element of exclusivity. And that is important. It, it kind of lets you into the secret. This is just for you. So, Boeing Expanding Footprint of South Carolina Facilities. This is cool. It's got the company name in there as well. It says exactly what the content is, and this happens to be from a business publication that deals with investments and business in South Carolina. It's clear what they're going to receive, and those that are interested in that content are going to open it. Uh, this is a good this, this next one, this deals a crime, the murder mystery repeat offender deal. This happens to be from a bookstore that deals exclusively in murder mysteries. It's kind of cute. It's kind of funny. This deals a crime. It goes back to um, exclusivity, the murder mystery repeat offender, i.e. repeat customers. It's got urgency to it and it's got humor. Humor is fantastic, but don't sacrifice the clarity for the humor. And finally, very high open rate, nursery flannel from Cloud9 Organics is now available at company. So this one, it's just clear. This is a boring, obvious subject line that has an amazing engagement rate, simply because no one is left in any doubt as to what they're going to find. And this happens to be of interest to the recipient. So that's it. Um, I've been talking nonstop for 45 minutes and I'm happy to continue talking, but this is up to you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Ask me anything. I'll, uh, I'll bring up my chat here. Um, and if anyone isn't sure where the chat is, I will say hi and you should see it pop up. So you can click there and ask any questions. We'll give it a couple minutes. Um, if there's no questions, we'll, we'll call this a wrap. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. Um, I love talking about the stuff. Thank you so much to Amoeba. I always feel a little bit awkward saying Amoeba, A-M-I-B-A. And, you know, most of all, thank you guys for, for what you do. Being an independent business owner is, is amazing. It's important. People forget small business is the biggest engine of any economy. So thank you, guys. Okay. Um, I have a question about collecting email addresses. What's the, okay, sure, John, while you write your question, I'll answer Angela's question. Um, the best day of the week to send newsletters. Now, Angela, this one's a tricky one. 
So common, common accepted, accepted knowledge says between Tuesday and Thursday, roughly in the late morning to early afternoon. However, I don't actually accept that. I don't accept that because you're different to everyone else. And that's true. What is more important is your subject line and your list health. So sending on a Tuesday is not going to get you better results than sending on a Wednesday. I simply think that they looked at such a wide range that something had to actually have a result. Now, a lot of that comes down to um, old sales stats, as in most people tend to, to buy things Tuesday to um, Tuesday to, to Thursday between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So I'm not entirely sure that you should worry too much about the day of the week. I think you should worry more about being consistent and having great content. But I did want to get, at least give you a specific answer Tuesdays. Interesting things, you might have a lower um, read rate on the weekend, but often people have a higher conversion rate on the weekend, and also Mondays often have a higher click-through rate, although not necessarily the highest purchasing rate. So you see this starts to get a little bit silly, and I wouldn't stress about that at all. Okay, John. John asks, uh, if we have an online contact us form and someone completes and submits that form asking for information, can you add them to your list? So technically, the official answer from blacklists and from ISPs is no. You can't add them to the list without asking them to sign up specifically. Now, you don't have to have a checkbox that says um, join our newsletter, but that's a good starting point. However, once someone contacts you, Write them back when you answer them and say, by the way, may we add you to our newsletter list so we can stay in touch. It's a good idea. Um, you know, to be honest, I would say you can use your judgment. If they're customers, customers are okay. So if they, if they become a customer, if they're in the process of becoming a customer and the numbers are not great, I would say that's probably okay. But the official legal make blacklists happy answer is no. They should specifically say in some way, add me to your list. Um, I want to subscribe, something like that. So, you know, the bottom line, John, is your judgment. Um, yes, I would say if they bought something and you collected the email address, absolutely, you can, you can, you can include them. I would, if, if we asked you when you signed up for Mad Meme in our verification process and you gave us that answer, that would be 100% okay. So yes. Cool. Any other questions, guys? All right. Jeff asks, I understand many emails viewed may not be counted as opens in certain email interfaces. Um, if Mimi's dashboard says 35% of our emails were opened, can you assume a somewhat higher percentage were actually read? Absolutely, and I've heard up to 20% more can be assumed, but I think that might be a little bit optimistic. But you can certainly assume at least 5 to 10% more. Um, and let me explain how this all works, because it is interesting. So the way all email programs track a view is if images were, were loaded and some email clients like Yahoo, for example, or AOL don't necessarily show images right away. They ask you to download images or load images. And this was an anti-spam tactic that is now becoming a little bit outdated. And it's worth noticing, noting that Gmail is now moving towards automatically showing the images anyways so is Yahoo unless it's specifically in the spam folder. So many, many email clients are moving towards showing images anyways because we've moved past that, that kind of tactic in the spam world anyways. Um, so unless image, so when an image is downloaded, it makes a call to Mad Mimi servers and we know that someone read the email so we mark it as a view. This is the standard way Everyone um, tracks views via email and, and similar, similar kind of services. 
So uh, that's, that's why it's actually very useful to include images. And some people even say, make sure to allow images. Other good news is that if someone allows images consistently from you, they'll stop asking them to download the images and they'll just automatically load the images if in, in, as a um, email client like Gmail. So that's why I think 20% may be a little bit optimistic, but I would say you can probably safely assume 5%, 5% more. By the way, Jeff, if you're getting 35% view rates, be very proud. The average tends to be 10% to the high end of average is 25%. Above that, you're doing fantastically. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, type them now. I'm gonna just jump on a little bit of a, an aside that Jeff's inspired me to, to discuss. Um, and that's frequency. So Angela asked about the time of day and Jeff asked about view rates. And that got me thinking about frequency. And a common question is, how often should I send a newsletter? So raise your hand, anyone who actually was going to ask that. Um, how often should you send a newsletter simply depends on you. How often can you consistently do it? Most people can consistently set aside an hour a month to do it. I recommend minimum monthly. However, if your once a month email gets a 35% view rate and you increase to weekly, People tend to be turned off, or, or even twice a month. People to get turned off because that is going to naturally lower your view rate, simply because you can't reach everyone all the time. And, and if you send four times where you used to send one, you're probably going to get a lower view rate. But that's okay, because if you had 35% once a month, and you suddenly get 20% four times, Assuming some of them are going to be the same each time, some of them are going to be unique, the odds are you're going to overall end up with a 45% unique views in the month. So um, I hope I made that clear, but increasing your frequency to a reasonable level is going to actually increase the people you reach in that given time frame in a month. You may not reach as many people per email, but overall in that month you're going to reach more people. So I think the sweet spot is roughly once a week, once every two weeks, once a month should be your minimum. Cool. Any other questions? Um, just in case anyone's typing a really long, long email, you can just hit return where you're at and send so I know that you're, uh, you're writing. Otherwise, I will uh, give it another minute and we can wrap this up. Again, thank you guys so much for, for listening and feel free to email me. I'll write in my email address here. Email me anytime, dinamadmini.com. I will reach out to, to everyone who had registered with a link to download all the, all the content for this, the, the slides. And we will also have a recorded version up and we'll let you know where the recorded version is. I'm not sure whether Mad Mimi or Amoeba is going to host it, but we will have it up. This has been all recorded. Cool. And with that, thank you guys and have a lovely Tuesday. Bye, everyone.